Well, you guys, I, uh, I want to remind you we have a chat feature over on the side if you, if you want to say anything, um, and maybe put, put, put your name and where you're from, if you want to be that public, you, you, don't, you don't have to be. Um, but we'll wait just another couple minutes and um, then we'll get started. For those of you that are here, I just want to say thank you. My name is uh, Pastor Dan McKnight. I'm one of the pastors at Caw Prairie Community Church which was fortunate enough to be uh, the, uh, Walter's home church for a little while. And that's how he and I got to know each other. And that's how he and I got to know each other. And so, yes, there we go. Thanks, Shannon, for modeling, putting your name out there. And uh, remember, we'll have a we'll have a decent sized we'll size crowd. So remember to leave your microphone on mute if possible. And then you can unmute when you, yeah, want to say something. So, thanks, Laura. I introduce you to and through uh, responding. How's Sandy today? Hi, Sandy. Hi, Pastor Dan. How are you? Uh, uh, Hello, Jackie and Laura and Steve. Oh, wow. Well, so um, just to give us a, a, a little bit of a sorry late dinner video off so you don't have to watch us eat. Well, Trad and Chase, Chad and Tracy over, and we want to thank you for that courtesy. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, if you didn't bring enough for the whole class, uh, thanks for keeping your camera off. Uh, well, you, you guys, I want to... Um, I want to begin by saying again, thank you for, for dropping in tonight. I expect we'll have uh, more fill in as time goes on, but uh, you know, we don't have, we don't have a ton of time. If you're from the East coast, you're probably, um, it's probably getting late. And if you're, um, well, if you're anywhere, you've got a, bu a busy life. So again, I want to say thank you for being willing to join us tonight. There are people here who are friends of others, uh, members of different churches, um, and all sorts of all sorts of people who have um, a desire to see the world be a better place, and for that to happen, um, there's a lot of us that have to learn a lot of things. And, and tonight, um, what's gathering us together are the are both the images and the the, the terrifying stories that that all of America has seen uh, recently. And so we want to be asking um, those of uh, those of you who are primarily our African American brothers and sisters, to uh, to help those of us who are white and don't don't live in the exact same world that you do, um, help us see what what we need to see as just fellow citizens, as fellow Christians, um, or just fellow people that uh, that have blind spots bigger than we even can imagine. So, um, I wanted to begin by asking uh, my friend Walter Hill. Um, to uh, say a few words for those of you who don't know Walter, um, for those of you who do, you'll 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 know a lot more, or you you could have said a lot more than I'm going to say. But for the Caw Prairies who might not know Walter and the others in Kansas City, um, Walter was a member and an active um, leader developer at, at our church um, for his as long as he was here in the Kansas City area. I was blessed to get to know him, and we become friends um, over the years uh, while he was here, and then after he left, uh, he's um, showed my wife and me some really good cooking tips uh, he, when he would be here to visit and uh, see his son Devin play volleyball up at Park University um, for volleyball tournaments there. So that's how um, that's how Walter and I go back. And um, uh, the the format that uh, 
Walter and I have uh, kind of agreed to is that I'm going to kind of hand it over to him. He's going to share something of his story. And, and those of you um, particular, no, it can change, but, but my thought was those of you who are um, African-American share with us how you've been feeling over the last, well, as long as, as long as you've been feeling. Um, share things that, that we need to know and, and Walter and I will prompt with questions and if uh, anybody else wants to um, wants to toss questions up in the chat room um, that might be a little easier than than shouting in the, or out if everybody else is talking so um, I uh, is that Devin I see signing in um, yeah hey Devin <laughs> good to see you again anyway so uh, Walter I'll turn it over to you um, Welcome and uh, thanks for your leadership in getting such an awesome group of friends and family here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Dan. And, you know, I, thanks everyone for joining. And, you know, this all started out me calling Dan with an idea because here in California, I had a couple people that came and asked me about sitting out on the, on the uh, patio and, and talking about race and diversity. I, I run a, um, a Be a Bridge group in, in Ventura that meets where I get to cook, but also get to share meals and talk about different things, about differences of races and ethnicity and all kinds of topics and about learning about people. So it kind of started that way, but I called Dan to get some ideas and he said, guess what? I was just thinking of, <laughs> thinking of you. So God's always at work and it was timing and, and you know, and having a, a, a platform to be able to share experiences and have a better understanding of what's kind of going on there from a different aspect of people might, that might have experiences and the negative experiences in their life is, is just a benefit. And I appreciate all the, the friends I have that are on here that probably have heard me talk a little bit about it, but a little more detail on sharing some of maybe their experiences. And so we all can learn from each other and, and be able to be better at reacting and understanding and be able to share that word with someone else maybe or maybe just the start of being able to say something and say something so people kind of get a better idea. Uh, and the feelings that go through, you know, some of the African-American men that are on here and women that, and friends, what does that make them feel when they see some of the things that are going on that are happening? So we all can have a better understanding. So with that in mind, uh, I appreciate everyone's uh, on the call now and listening and just understand this, this can go anywhere you want it to go, and it can just be a start of conversation. And it doesn't have to end like this. It doesn't have to end anywhere. It can be a possibility of guys the limit, especially with uh, technology and things we can do and where we can share our voices and everything like that. So, but this is being recorded, right, Dan? Uh, yes, it is. So um, hopefully that's well. I am recording it, so you know. Um, and I hope you're, that won't uh, inhibit you from sharing. We, we certainly wouldn't. Uh, uh, share it in any way that's uh, disrespectful or, or taking it out of context. Um, but it, yeah, if you say something that's really, um, that would really be a teaching moment for um, people in our church, I, I would like to use that for that. So um, with, with that understood, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Walter. Well, Walter, you were going to share a story. Um, I think you, you had told me from the first time you recognized that as an African-American young man, uh, you were looked at in a way you were surprised that people looked at you different than you expected to be. Right. And, the, and that happened there. The first time that happened to me is when I was in high school. And a couple of people know this. I was on my way to a, a soldier field to a football game. And I had my suit on my back and I was downtown Chicago and I was walking to soldier field from the train to go to, uh, to, go to work. And it was kind of dark and it was a night game for the Bears. As I was walking down the street though, about 60 feet in front of me was a, a white woman that looked up at me and just ran across the street. And me, I was going, okay, what was that about? What happened? I'm looking behind me thinking some, you know, a dog's coming or something because she's running. But they were looking at me. And I tried to look at myself going, did I look like a thug? Or, no, I had a suit on and everything. So I don't know, but I, I, I kind of played it off at that time was that's probably her experience and she probably had a bad experience with someone in her past and it made her react that way and I took it that way. But it also made me realize that I'm being looked at differently 
and it's different and maybe I have to act different in order to be accepted because someone will visually see me and respond differently. And it was kind of hard to take. And I'm sure there's some other people that have had that experience also. But for me, that was the first time I felt like, what's wrong with me and why, why is that? I, I didn't I didn't think I looked like a threat to, to do anything. You know? And that's kind of the first experience I had, Dan, in my life that made me think differently that I can't just go around thinking that someone might react a different way because they see Is that rung true with anyone else here that, that uh, in a city or public situation, you've, people have been afraid of you? And I'm, you know, just like probably William on here, you know, just like probably William on here, I'm 6'3 six, six and I'm 270. <laughs> so I'm not a little guy. Uh, well, I did have some similar like that. Uh, I've always been, uh, well, always been, but I've, I've been an athlete. I've been training for various sports. And uh, one day I was running down the street and I come to a crosswalk. And the person in the car was Caucasian. And they saw me coming towards the car and they automatically locked the doors. Um, I didn't see why or why they were fear of me because I was running and sweating and everything else. Uh, it's one situation. Um, another situation was I was watering my mother's yard and uh, a couple of guys yelled out and called me a nigger uh, for no reason whatsoever. Um, of course, it, I got upset and tried to chase a car down the street and they ran through a red light and they got pulled by the cops. I thought it was pretty funny. So, <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, William, for sharing. Thank you, William, for sharing. Fred? Well, I... Been out here in the uh, trucking industry. I've been out here for 34 years, and being able to um, come up to the all all kind of races of people, and you know we have our CB radios where you know we how we communicate with, with one another. But um, I've had a few occasions where you know some white guys, you know. I can recall one time I was at a truck stop and this guy to getting fuel in my truck and this white guy in Missouri, um, he walked, he was walking by my truck and, and he was like mean mugging me, looking at me, rolling his eyes and I was doing paperwork and I'm like, I looked down like, okay, what's his problem? And he just walked in front of the truck, just looking at me he was a local guy in a dump truck, and so I'm like, what was that all about? So he got in his truck, and he was taking off. I seen him, you know, reach for his CB, and he got to calling me niggers and this and that. You, in, the, in, in, that, in that particular truck I was driving, said, you niggers think y'all, you know, got it going on. You got to talking about all the different, and I'm like, I'm like, you would do that after you leave, you know, but you want, you know, you didn't do it in the face. And that's one of the things I hear that we deal with as, as blacks is a lot of, you know, the, the racial thing that's going on out here, they get behind their radios and hide behind their radios. I'm, I'm not violent whatsoever. It, it'll take a lot to get me started. You know, I, I, I hear name calling and I don't let that bother me, you know, to, 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 to a certain extent, but we, we, we hear it all the time, you know, we getting called all kind of, you know, names, monkeys and all that kind of stuff, porch monkeys and things of being that in nature. But, you know, I, you know, as being a Christian, you know, and, and raised up in the church and being uh, in, in the ministry, I, you know, my father always told me, you know, taught me as a kid, sticks and stones, you know, my brick with bones, the words never hurt me. And I've always stuck with that, and it's it's kind of hard for me to just just instantly latch on to somebody, you know, you know, calling me out my name because I know that's not what I am, and I just pray for them, you know, and, and they just you know and let God deal with them on that situation. 
Thanks for sharing, Fred. Thanks for sharing. Fred. My son's on. My other son is my on. My son's right. on. My other son is on. Right. Say hello, Christoph. Hey, how's everybody doing? Welcome, Christoph, to uh, this Caw Prairie Theology on Tap Zoom <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Chad Smith, and I'm a, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, when I finished my residency, uh, uh, I was a chief resident, and all the other uh, people in the, uh, in the program got offers uh, to join practices, except for me. And so uh, the, a lot of the things we see are not as uh, forward as calling you names. There's a, some hidden things underneath where you don't get opportunities that other people get. Thanks, Chad. I had something similar happen to me at Oracle. <laughs> so I can relate with that. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, shout out to Shad. He, uh, he's, he's done um, presentations for our uh, staff. Uh, uh, he's here in our uh, Kansas City area. Thank you, uh, Shad, Dr. Smith. For yeah. Being well, yeah, the other thing about that is that uh, when you ask why, they say that uh, we like you, we're not prejudiced, except that our clients are prejudiced. And therefore, we mm. can't have you here because we don't want <laughs> to upset our clients. Wow. Has, has that, money. I'm sorry. Has that changed over the years? Um, for those of you in the in African Americans in, in professions like medicine or you know, trucking or anything, has prejudice gotten less? Has prejudice gotten less? No. It's gotten worse. No. Oh, no. it's gotten worse. No. Right. No. Worse. Hmm. That's worse. It's gotten worse. I've had a situation like that as well, where on a job, a few jobs, that I was more qualified than some of the other guys that was coming in. And a lot of times I got turned down for the, for the promotion and they would bring somebody else in. It would be a white guy that was with a lot less experience than I had. And mm -hmm. a few cases, those guys come in and wreck the trucks where, you know, I have a, you know, clean free record, you know, <laughs> and they come in, bring them in, you know, just because, and they want to not, not pan it out, but they still would just go by and get someone else than the person that that's, you know, more qualified for the position. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I wanted to say, uh, Fred, I wanted to say, Fred, I had the same situation at Oracle where they offered me a position to be a manager and the guy said he wasn't sure. And then two weeks later, he hired another white guy that has no experience in software or anything. And then when I questioned him on it, I got thre a threatening email because I said something. So that wow. happened to me too. Um, and I, I don't know what to do about it. It's like so much you want to say something about the things that happened, but a lot of things are just not, you know, you, you say something and you get reprimanded because you speak up. You know, I sure appreciate everybody that shared. Um, are, are there others here? I see uh, some some Cobb Prairiers that, that I know. Um, Lauren, uh, uh, Jackie. <laughs> I, I I'll, I'll share. Um, I don't know. Can Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so my my experiences growing up were probably very different than others, just from the standpoint of growing up in San Francisco, California, it's, it's a very diverse environment where diversity is accepted. I mean, I remember in elementary school celebrating Cinco de Mayo and Chinese New Year and, you know, the different holidays and people were bringing food. And as, as I went and as I grew and as I went off to college, um, that was where more I started to see systemic racism and, and the fact that um, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. Uh, when, I, when I went to Kansas State, um, the majority of the colored people were athletes. So the, the student body did not match um, 
the, the number of kids there that were of color. Um, as I got into the workforce and, and as I started to, to grow and get more master's degrees, people didn't look like me. And um, as an educator now in the classroom, um, it's very difficult when, you know, I hear teachers talking or I hear people talking and they say, no, that kid can't learn or, and, and it's, it's never towards kids that are not color, even though, you know, that kid may be dis, um, disruptive or that kid may be disrespectful, but when it, it's a kid of color, it becomes such a big issue and they got to get out of my classroom and, um, the, the, the biggest thing to me is with the systematic racism that's going on is now that it's social media is so prevalent to me that's why people are being so disgusted by it but it, it's been going on forever I mean when I and it, it's funny because again I'm an educator now never thought that I, I would ever say that but I <laughs> um, but when I was in seventh grade uh, I, I had a Caucasian teacher that that said that I was disrespectful and I was a troublemaker and I got sent to the office and my, my mom was the type of person that she said, okay, if he's doing that, she, she went to school with me all day. She sat in all my classrooms with me. And I remember going to that class, you know, and the teacher gave me assignment. I got it done. And once I got it done, just like any, you know, 12, 13 year old kid, I start messing around. Well, that to her was being disrespectful. You know, the, the, it wasn't the fact that, I was a good student. It was that now I was distracting other students. And um, my mother was very upset with that, that I got a label of being something based off of me completing my work. It, it, and it wasn't because, you know, I was just belligerent or anything, but the connotation that, that she addressed my parents with and she addressed me with, um, I, I didn't think about it at that time, but my mom told me that, that story when I was in high school. And I was like, no, I was just bored. I mean, I didn't have anything to do. I got my work done. I did what I was told to do. And then, you know, I figured that, you know, I have, I have free reign. You know, I can do whatever. And that, that teacher didn't, didn't really come to that. And I think for a lot of the issues we, we start to see is a lot of people don't understand, especially kids of color. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people don't understand um, – or, or fail to understand mannerisms of people of color. I was talking to, I have a cop buddy in Olathe that that's one of the three minority officers on, on the Olathe police force. Um, and he's like, when I come to a scene and I, and I see, you know, a black or a brown person using their hands or, you know, talking aggressively or being angry, he, he's like, I get it. I know what they mean. He said, but you know, when, when my counterpart comes there, a, a white counterpart may come there, you know, they feel like it's a threat. They feel like, and so it's that, that, that complicit bias, it's that, you know, ideology of, oh, they're talking with their hands, so, so they're going to attack me, instead of really understanding culturally that, I mean, that's just a, that's just a part of the culture. Um, if you ever went to a black family reunion, everybody's talking with their hands. It's not, it's not uncommon, but again, it's just understanding the cultural differences. Mm. What what learnings do you think any of you think that that white America could and should learn at this at this unique and well this this powerful juncture of history um, with with all the you know, protests and um, what what are you hoping will happen what do you think is realistic to happen um, what do you what do you challenge other African Americans or, or or white folks or anybody else to to do in this in this time. I have something. If, if nobody else has something. Hey, Devin. Hello. So um, my mom actually. So my mom's white, um, and she actually talked to me earlier today about being at the store at a grocery store, and she saw a black woman looking at like eye makeup and my mom does it, Mary Kay. So she wanted to ask the black woman if she like needed any help finding anything or anything like that. But she told my mom told me that 
when she was about to ask her, she thought about all that's going on right now and thought about how it could be received, whether this black lady was going to tell her to like, that she doesn't want anything to do with her or anything like that. So she felt like she, she held back instead of like reaching out and like trying to, and trying to help her out. And I just feel like, I feel like the best way to go about it, if you're like a white person or a black person, is just to try to show that we're not, like, we respond to hate with love. Like, so even if that black lady were to respond like negatively, the best thing you could do is just respond with love. And then that could change that white person or that black person's perspective on, okay, well, you know what I'm saying? This racism that I've felt in the past, you know, maybe there, maybe there's another, a, a, you know, a new chapter that we can get past to. So I'll just say though, like, just make sure you don't look at it in terms of how they might respond, but what change that you might have a possibility of making in their lives. So, so uh, thank you, Devin. Thanks, Devin. You know, Dan, yeah, I just want to say one thing about awareness. You know, I, I see a lot of things happening in my life and not respond and react. And I always tell and some of the kids on the phone, they'll always tell them, you know, instead of reacting and respond, just count, count to five, count to seven before you even say anything. Give it time to think about it before we respond. And I've had situations where I could have responded in anger, but I counted and I waited and then I respond. And I actually had an incident that happened when I was in, uh, it's funny you say this, because I'll tell you about a story when I was in uh, St. Louis. I went to get my uh, passport at the post office. And as I went in the post office, I got my passport and I was coming back out and I had a red Prius, really nice car, I just bought it. So as I was going in the car, an older white guy walked by my car and just spit on it. And I thought about it, like I said, I didn't react. I just said, wow, what was that for? And instantly what came in my, my mind was, I just need to pray for him because I can wash that off. It's not anything that's going to hurt me. But as I walked to the car, I looked at the spin, and then I looked at him, and he walked over his car, and I looked, and he looked at me, and he went around to his car, and he got a rag, and he wiped off my car, and he said, I am so sorry, a bug flew in my mouth. And I give that example because sometimes we react too quick without just thinking and praying for a person. And even if he was, he had hatred, all I could do is pray for him and just get in my car and drive away and go through the car wash. It, it really is not worth me feeding the negative. And that's the way I kind of look at things because I don't think God wants me to feed negative. He wants me to feed the positive and pray for the negative. Now, that's all I have to say about that. Wow. And just also, I, I just want I just want to think, tell everyone, this is a safe environment. You can say whatever you say. You're not going to be judged on this call. I, I told Dan that when he asked me about talking, this is not a call to judge anyone because they have an idea or some question might be stupid because it isn't. We only know what we know. And we need to be in a safe place to ask questions about what we don't know and get people with love in their heart and their minds to respond to it in a positive way to teach and learn from each other. And we lo I love people to share their experiences because I learn. That's all. Thank you, Walter. Thanks for that permission. Um, Mary, I see your hands up. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm tuning in late. But I just want to give uh, an experience and then tell you how I, a little bit of how I feel about what's going on now. Uh, I, it, I was a teller back in the 70s, and nobody in the whole building looked like me, even the janitors and the cooks or anything, about 20 tellers there, all of us, and nobody would come to my line, nobody. Very seldom, maybe somebody would say, I don't care what they say, I'm not standing in line, I'm coming to you. So the head teller who was young, Again, that's why I think the young people are gonna, gonna help us through this. Uh, she would shut down all the tellers except me. They had no choice except to come to me. 
and they would complain, but she was very, very nice to them, said, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, but all the other tellers are balancing, but Mary will be glad to help you. And I worked so hard to get all get that line down. I just felt so good. Every afternoon, I got customers. And I just wanted to tell you that I feel different. I've been, I'm old enough to have gone through lots of, lots of uh, uh, racism and lots of stuff, marching and all that. But I just feel different about it this time because of the involvement, the diversity, and the young people are, they, I think when they've seen this video and then I'm starting to realize what we're going through and to see that diversity, I just feel different now. I just feel like hopeful that things are going to change because it, they're starting to change. And with this whole pandemic thing, I think a lot of things are changing because people on the bottom that you never even paid any attention to, they're getting interviewed. People that uh, pick up the trash, do the cleaning up, all of a sudden now they're so important. And I just think there's, I just feel that there's a change that's happening right now throughout the world. That's just what I had to say. That's powerful. Um, Dan, can I can I ask a question? Is that all right? Oh yeah, Walter has said we are we are clear to ask questions. <laughs> um, well, my name is my name is Chris. I'm Dan's colleague at, at Cobb Prairie, and um, I guess one of the things that I've been wrestling with over the past. Uh, week just watching everything unfold is where to find the balance as a privileged white person, which I know I am, the balance between listening um, to those who are more experienced than me and have so much more insight than me, but also speaking up um, because I, I feel a need to speak up. I don't want to be silent to the things I'm seeing. And I'm having a hard time knowing where that balance is. Um, so any insight and in, in, into that would be awesome. Well, I can give you my view on that, Chris, and, and just about uh, where balance, I, I talk about this all the time about balance. There needs to be a little bit of both, but I think you said the first thing in start is, is listening. And really listening, and, and this is the thing about being heard, and you hear these things all the time. This is all, some of these things are not new, but there are also things that have been going on and no one's listening. It's the same thing when people march. They just say, some people say, well, they march, it'll go away and we'll go back to the same way it was. And like Mary, I feel like it's different because I think people are listening. And listening in a change and something that's been going on, not recently, not in the last years, but a long, long time. And it's deeply, it's deeply embedded into this whole country. But until people wake up, and, and Dan and I spoke about this word, woke, you know, it's time to wake up and, and see the things that are going on. Because we have, and everybody has a little bit of privilege, some things we don't see going on because nobody says anything, and they, they don't think if they say anything, it would make a difference. So I think, you know, what you're asking and, and about balance is being able to listen, but being able to take that what you listen to and put the people around you that can you give you advice and you love how you might respond. And Dan's a witness of that because he knows when I'm challenged, I reach out to all those, some of these people on this call, they know I'll reach out to them and, and qualify my thoughts and what I should do. And I don't have all the answers, but if I have a group of people, I'll get a bunch of different ideas. And what idea comes a thought and the thought comes a process and then there comes execution. And that's the way I, I would, that's my thoughts on that, Chris. Thank you. Chris, I, I would also say, I, I would echo Walter's thoughts, um, but I would also say, don't forget about your privilege. Know that it's there. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't understand that it truly, it, it, it is a privilege that some of us don't, don't have. You know, in just the, the color of your skin, um, in today's day and age, 
people see that as, as different and as privilege. And so don't forget that you have that, but use that for good. You know, use your powers for good, you know, um, of how you can help others when, you know, when, when they're, they're being held down or being held back or something like that. How can you help to lift up? Thank you. For those of you who don't know, uh, for several years, Chris was our, our youth pastor and still has a great uh, heart for uh, youth and students. And, um, you know, I, I know, I know, Devin, you, you shared, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, William, uh, maybe you haven't yet, and I, I see a Megan Black, who's a, a secondary um, ed. Are you a principal, Megan, or something like that? I am a, an assistant principal at a high school, yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's if there's insight from the from the the youngest generation here or the people who work with them about guidance for for all of us who are older. Um, it, it was just thrilling for me, Mary, to hear your Mary Macklin to hear about your excitement for the possibilities. And I'm wondering if that's something that those of you who are younger or work with younger people um, also feel. I mean, I would probably tend to agree with Mary that the youth is full of hope and they are going to be the ones who make a lot of change. And I see it every single day at school, um, kids advocating for themselves, ad advocating for others. Um, and there's a lot of power in our youth. So I was kind of giving you an amen over here, Mary, when you were saying, saying that. So I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that for sure. They're a great generation that I think oftentimes we can, it's been like this, you know, since the beginning of time where we always look at like teenagers and like, oh, they're so this or they're so that or their music is terrible, but really they're the ones who are going to make this world a better place and they're, they're so full of just new ideas and um, just the way that they are able to work with one another and see things from a different lens. Um, I really appreciate when a student will say something and just make me change my perspective just a little bit. And so I'm very fortunate to be able to work in this profession for sure. I, I kind of wanted to echo that with, with Megan. Um, uh, most kids, I would say, especially younger kids, don't see color. Like they, you know, that their friend groups are so diverse, and they're so unique, and they have things in common. And I, I honestly don't know when that separation happens, where we like really start to look at individuals as they are this color, and because of that, this color, that they have this status. And that, that for me is the disheartening part. And I 100% believe in, you know, watching some of the protests. I mean, it, it is a lot of younger individuals. I mean, from, you know, 15 to 30. Uh, and, and my biggest concern with these people is get out and vote. I mean, if, if you want your word to be known and you want your feelings to be known, I mean, that voting is the number one thing. And I, and I always talk to my seniors about it um, from the standpoint of, I don't care who you vote for, but I mean, you, you need to get out and vote and you need to represent, you know, what our democracy is for. And I think going forward in our country, um, as, as people of Christ, I think, you know, making your voting, voting choices based off of, you know, are they Channeling those types of behaviors, you know, are they are they tr treating each other like they want to be treated? You know, are they are they honoring God with their choices? Uh, again, we're humans; we're not going to be perfect. We're going to make bad choices and bad decisions, but you know, are they following, you know, those types of models? You know, caring for others, and I, I think that's where in, in the African American community. You, we, we tend to bounce back from things like this and we let them slide because we, we are such a close-knit group. And I mean, 
we have each other's back and all, and all those types of things. But I think as a country, I think we have to see more of that. And that kind of goes back to what, what Chris was asking about is, you know, to me that balance is, you know, being there for others and helping others and reaching a handout. And, you know, that young man talked about um, his mom on that asked about makeup and, and making that jump. And yeah, it, it, it may sometimes come back to, to slap you in the face or there may be some backlash but it's the effort and the thought that counts. And I think sometimes when we're doing things for good, it's not, it's not always going to turn out the way you think it's going to, but still reaching that hand out and still showing that compassion and that love through Christ. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. And, and for me as a teacher, I think that's why kids like me just from the standpoint, I talk to all kids. I don't care your race, ethnicity, understanding. Well, I mean, those things don't matter to me. You know, I mean, I, I love all my kids. I was if you know they're great one day and not great one day, but it's it's more of that and I think in society that's a super super important. Yeah, and to kind of piggyback on some things that Lauren said there too, I you know I think it's also naive to think that it's one big happy family every day at school. You know, like there are tensions that arise and, and some of them are racial in nature, and it's just having the integrity to face those head on and um, have those conversations with kids, have those conversations with parents and say, this is what happened at school today. We, we, we are not going to tolerate this happening at school. And most of the time parents are like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We did not raise our, you know, son or daughter to say these things or to do these things. And uh, it, it's, it's the conversation that has to be had. Um, and we, we do see that sometimes and it breaks my heart um, when we have to deal with situations like that. But I don't want to also say, you know, the entire generation is open-minded and willing to, you know, uh, put differences aside because we do still have work to do there. And so um, I think acknowledging that is, is a important step as well. Yeah. I would have to agree with that statement. Um, Growing up in a predominantly white area, uh, the first time I was racially discriminated against was actually first grade. And so um, I ended up having to move classes because all of like statements of like actions that I did not do, like a girl was being threatened to like her animals were going to be killed and all, I was going to harm her family, but they were just false statements, you know. And then the next time I was racially discriminated was actually in seventh grade. And like me being athletic, a lot of the, a lot of my athleticism, people credit to being black. They're like, "Well, you're because you're black. You're th you're this much faster. That's why you don't lose." Da 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 da. But it has nothing to do with that. I just work harder, you know. And then I think that's also why I work so hard in school. I have a four point four GPA. I'm taking five AP classes. You know, I take all these steps because I don't want anyone to hold that against me. That like I'm just because I'm black is the reason why I've made it so far in life. You know, and that's what it's hard to kind of like wrap around my, your mind around is like, I'm listening to your guys' stories and it's like the same stuff that I've been going through my life still. You know, I still get followed in stores time to time. You know, I was uh, in eighth grade, I was with a group of white friends. I was the only one to ask for you to have their backpack put down after school when we were at a concession store. You know, it's just like stuff like that. And you can instantly tell like the difference. You know, William, I, I want to piggyback kind of on that because to me, this is where we start to see well, where did that kid learn that from? Mm. That that is the bigger issue. You know, why is uh, you are saying those things? And I think that's hurting because. And I can tell you this, like my, my son who's mixed, I mean, he, he experiences that, but if you look at his classroom, there aren't very many kids that look like him. And so he, he, he does get picked on. And I, I struggle with how would a first grader know what your ethnicity is unless they have been blatantly told by parental figures. And, um, 
again, as, as a black man growing up, I, I had to deal with those issues too. You know, you, you're a three sport athlete because you're black. And, and again, those things can fly in, in, in certain areas. And in Johnson County, I will tell you that happens a lot in our schools. Um, when you look at some of our top athletes, but the, the big thing I think that you're doing well is you're not perpetuating the stereotype. You're an academic student. You're not just an athlete. And you're, you know, persevering through some of those difficulties, which I think, you know, all, all of the older people have had to at some point in time, whether it be with a job or, you know, uh, you know, I, people look at me funny when I walk in the stores. You know, I, I have I have dreads, and <clears throat> again, you know, the the immediate reaction for most people when they see my hair is, you know, he must be a thug or he must be this. And I think breaking those stereotypes is part of the battle, and and changing the persona from. Um, the characteristics of certain people of, of what an African American male is, um, because again, if you look at media, if you look at film, I mean, we're perpetuating with this stereotype, which is also a system that's been put in place. And you know that you know it's every you know every every uh, when I was growing up, every black male was boys in the hoods. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but that that was the thought process. Oh, you got a blue shirt on, you must you must be in a gang. And I mean, it it's sad because instead of getting to know people, you start to judge people. And Lauren, that breaks my heart. I, um, yeah, two things, Lauren is beloved. Uh, when, when he's in the lobby and there's high schoolers in there, they, uh, they, they know Coach Clark and they, and they love him. Um, and I will also say Dr. Smith that, uh, uh, William's going to go to Vanderbilt and become an uh, osteopathic surgeon. Is that right? William? Orthopedic. Orthopedic. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not even smart enough to pronounce the word. But, uh, <laughs> he tried. He tried. He tried. Uh, so, um, here's, here's another question, if that's all right. Um, you can all tell me to shut up if you want. Um, uh, but so, you know, we live in Johnson County. And I cannot tell you how many times I hear people say things like, you know, racism doesn't exist on a large scale. These are all isolated incidents. I, I mean, obviously, I don't think this, but this is something I hear all the time. Um, in fact, as we were talking about this Sunday, I heard somebody kind of reference to me really need to talk about this. Is this, you know, this is just an isolated thing. Um, to the people who, who are that far removed from this conversation, where do, where do we begin? Well, I just want to say one thing, Trista. This is a lot deeper, like I said in the beginning. But, you know, it's so deep. It's deeper than that because you got to look at something that people don't see because, you know, about having anything about African-American history, you, people are not taught about it. So they don't know. Yeah. They only hear things. And, you know, education and starting with education about history and only knowing someone like me being African, only knowing about other things in history, but not knowing about the history of my ancestors and my parents. You know, like I told Dan, Dan earlier, the only history and only only relationship, the only thing we know about as far as back as I can go is when they step out that boat. I don't have a heritage or a history in another country or coming from somewhere. We are we are actually not Africans because they don't accept us as being Africans. You know, my, my father's father was white, so, and my, my kids are like that. So it's like someone giving you a label, but also understanding that how would they feel if someone did it, did it to them? And it's the same thing about what, what and I told Dan, what strikes me always is I have triggers, and I have triggers the vision of slavery. It'll never go away because of what I know and what, I, what mom, her mom told me and what the history they told me. But it's something that's going to always be there because we're a country dividing. We've always, this country's always divided everyone. And they divided the lower class. How do you get rid of that? It's just, just like you say, young people have to change their thinking. And similar, like you said, young people are doing things because now there's more social media and there's more interaction. During my time, William, some of the, and Fred, some of the people, 
there wasn't a lot of that. You know, it was this area and this area, and the same thing like William was saying, if you're an athlete, you know, you get a little bit of, you get farther ahead, but you don't get the education and they think you can't do the work or someone want to be more academic. I could, this is back in the 70s. So there's a lot of history that goes on with that. And I think some people, when we talk about awareness, it's also education. And I think things would change a little bit, just like we're trying to understand on this call. I don't have a vehicle and know how you change that from an educational standpoint. But my sons will tell you, when they're in school, they actually asked me to come and teach African history during February. I'm not a teacher. They just said, can you come in and talk about African American history? Because they had no content. So I'd have to look up content and I'd have to tell stories. But that's kind of wild that you have African American History Month and the school district doesn't put content together so kids can learn. So I don't have any any vehicle to do that. If anybody want to chime, chime in on that, that'd be great. But that's just my experience. I would 100% you know, agree with that. Just being in like school now, it seems like in our history books, there's probably two chapters, two chapters that really go over black history. And that's it. You know, that really like damages, they don't want to like tarnish American history so much that they don't want to really reveal like what has really happened in our past. And that's where wow. it kind of goes wrong with the people just believe that like it was in the past and now it's over. And I've had heated discussions with classmates, with my peers about them saying that racism isn't a thing anymore. And I've gone off on people and explained to them my stories and I've explained to them like the world around them and they still don't believe it just because they've grown up in like this bubble and they haven't been educated enough to understand what is happening today and what has happened for 401 years and will continue to happen unless something changes. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's done any test testing on implicit bias. Has anybody used that? Uh, that's one of the most effective things that we work with is uh, helping people understand what their biases are. Uh, the other thing that you might do is ask uh, a white person, uh, if you gave them a million dollars, would be okay if they, if they were black? Is, is it worth a million dollars? And usually most people that I've heard uh, will not accept that. They would rather stay wow. white rather than uh, mm -hmm. get a million dollars. That kind of tells you where you are if, you're, if you look at it from that angle. Hmm. I, I would just like to say that uh, I, I don't have all the answers, but uh, working in my prior life when I worked with HR, we would try to get people to get out of their comfort zone and maybe hire somebody that didn't look like them or maybe talk to somebody that didn't look like you. Like I, I was on on the store on one of the stories that's with uh with the uh the protesting and all one stranger let 70 young kids of uh, all all diversity into his house and he said he let strangers in but then they all said we're no longer strangers because i think prejudice is fear fear of the unknown and it's just been handed down. You fear them, they're different, they're other. And if more people would get out of their comfort zone and talk to somebody or, or just, uh, uh, just try, like, uh, like uh, some of you have said, put somebody else in, think about them, whereas if it were you, how would you feel about something? And you could start by uh, just getting out of your comfort zone a little bit. And if you want to ask somebody uh, African American a question about something, go ahead. Uh, and and I'm sure. Well, I'm not sure, but there's going to be times. It's not going to all work out. Oh, you're not going to all have that kumbaya feeling, but just keep on doing it because it's worth it because people, we're all human beings and it's worth the effort. I actually had a quick question for you guys. Um, so the other day, actually, like for, for my whole life, I feel like 
I've kind of been put in a box where it's either like you, I'm either like a white black guy or a black white guy or like as if I'm supposed to be a certain way um, or identify as a certain culture. But it just makes me feel like I have to hate one side of like who, what makes me who I am. I'm not, I'm, I'm white and I'm black and I'm proud to be both. Like, I feel like having both like these perspectives has been able to make me so much more stronger or at least have a better understanding of both sides so I can make my own like interpretation of it. But at the same time, it's like, I still deal with, like I play volleyball, um, national champion uh, back in the day, retired now. But um, all my life, everybody's always talking about, like, oh, you must play basketball. Like, you know, yeah, I bet you can dunk. Like, like and of course, like, I mean, I might, I, I do like playing basketball, but it's like, when I say they play, well, I play volleyball, they're like, oh, they're like, oh, I wouldn't. That's like, it's so, it's so surprising to them. It's like, and it makes me feel like, oh, yeah, I'm like, I'm out of place. Or like, I shouldn't be doing this. But, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, my thing is, even even the other day, I, I met my neighbor at the pool the other day, um, a white guy all tatted up. Um, his wife was there at the pool and they were just speaking like straight Spanish. But he started talking to me and he was like, uh, he asked me like a little bit about myself, where I'm from. And I was like, I'm from Arizona. He was like, so what are you? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, are you black or white? And I was like, I'm both. And then he was just like, yeah, but like, what do you identify as? And I didn't really know how to respond because it's like already you're trying to limit me to like this concept that you create that like he's already created in his head. And then based off of that, you're going to treat me differently, like based off of whether I identify myself in a different like way. So and then he felt after that, he felt comfortable calling me like nigga. He was like, yeah, then I got niggas over in, in Chicago, too. And I was I'm just thinking in my in my head, like. Like, I just met this man a couple minutes ago. He's telling me about being in prison and stuff like that and how he's blacker than me because he's from Michigan. And it made me wonder, like, like my question to a lot of y'all is, like, what is it? What is blackness to you? Like, what does it mean? You know, is that something that I've tried to, like, try to identify myself? And, like, I feel like a lot of times, like, even, even, like, when I try to, when I, when I do, I, I, cause I love a lot of black culture and like it's in me and I can feel it in me, but it's like people will, will make me, want me to make me feel ashamed to be either black or, or to, ashamed or if I'm acting, if I'm, if I write well, I like to write, they're like, oh, you're whitewashed or something like that. It's like, it's like I'm only putting it in the box. So I just want to get your guys' perspective on that. That's a great question. Um... Number one is oh, wow. that, <laughs> yeah. Number one is that uh, it's human nature to try to categorize uh, individuals or things uh, immediately. So no matter what you look like, people are going to categorize you as one thing or other until they get to know you, and so it doesn't matter. Number two is that uh, you don't have to try to be something based on what other people think you should be. And when you start trying to be black this or white this, you're going to lose part of who you are. And you don't have to do that. And when you try to do that, you really, it's going to, you're, end up, you're going to end up worse off than you really are. So it's really important for you not to try to be a standard that somebody artificially creates for you because you're going to lose if you go in that direction. Yeah. But it's really important to recognize that it's part of human nature all the things we're talking about, if you go through the Bible, it's full of the kind of prejudice against different groups. It's just part of that. And just recognize that's part of being human. And from my perspective, that's part of our challenge is to overcome these natural tendencies that are out there. And that's kind of what we're doing today is trying to help deal with some of the physical, uh, emotional things that are, are, uh, are, are put to us. And this is just a test that I feel from a God perspective that we have to work with because it's not going to be given to us that everything's going to be good tomorrow. We're going to have the same kind of issues tomorrow and the next year. And this is not something that's going to go away. And if it, 
If it's not blacks, it's going to be Hispanics or it's going to be Native Americans or it's going to be gay. It's always something that's going to happen where we're going to try to uh, step on somebody's back in order to go forward as a community. So it's just something that we have to do as a community is to overcome these, these tendencies to judge people based on an external rather than what's inside of them. Thanks, Chad. That's, that's really great. Thanks for the answer. And it looks like Fred wanted to say something, but I'm not sure if he still has something to say. Fred? Well, um, first of all, Devin, consider yourself a child of God, one thing. That's, that's one thing that you do know that who you are and who you are. It doesn't matter what what race that you may be classified as being. Just know that one thing for sure that you are a child of God. And know that, you know, your parents are, are a mixed race, but just live that life of love. That's the, that's one of the main problems that we have in this world today is, you know, if everybody would show love, oh wow, what a wonderful world this would be. But we know that in this world that we're going to have the good and the bad. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know. And the Bible speaks of that, you know, the good and the evil. And we just have to just, you know, continue to do what we need to do as being Christian, true Christian brothers and sisters, and just try to get along with one another because God made us all the same. You know, um, I understand, you know, my Caucasian brothers and sisters, uh, you know, y'all have a, a lot better, you know, to be that, I, I heard him say the word privileged, you know, and, you know, with having good credit, you know, you're able to go and get things, you know, in corporations and banks, get loans that, you know, the black person, you know, that had just as much clout, we can't, you know, go in and get that, you know, but that's, that's society and, and corporations, how they treat, you know, the uh, difference between the two. So we need to know, boy, if we could just come together, you know, and, and with this racism, people are going to stereotype you regardless. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the black race stereotype each other, you know, and doing that, you know, and because I've had that problem as well, because I have a, you know, a mixed granddaughter, and I've, I've, I've had, had the question like, what color is she? I'm like, what does she look like? You know, what does it matter? You know, she's my granddaughter. I mean, why, why even ask that question? That's crazy. You know, so you telling me, you let me know where your mindset at. And this is black, you know, my own black people, you know, that ask those questions, you know, it just, you know, just like it is with, you know, the white race, our black race, we need to come together. We need to grow up and do something, you know, do something better than what we're doing as well as the, as the white race need to come together and understand the the flaws that that we're having with society, um, you know, looking at us, you know, in a whole different way, you know, and wow, you know, like I said, if, if everybody had their love, what a wonderful world it'd be, you know, and as somebody asked, you know, said the question, where does this, you know, at, at what age does kids start looking at blacks and white? Yes, it's being taught. <laughs> it's being taught. Um, my wife and I was in the state of Texas in one of the little smallest towns, and we love Dairy Queen ice cream. And so, of course, my wife and I was the only blacks in there. And wow, this white couple came in with their two little kids, you know, a little boy and a little girl. The little boy was the youngest. And so my wife knew that we were eating, you know, some blizzards, you know, and they were sitting over there on the other end. And so the little, the little boy, looked over and saw us. My wife and I were having a, having a casual, quiet conversation. And all of a sudden, the little boy said, Mommy, Daddy, look, 
look over there, monsters, monsters, daddy. And his his sister said, don't say that. Don't You can't tell them that. He was no more than about three or four years old. So it had to be taught, you know, that black <laughs> folks are monsters to them. So, yeah, so, you know, and, and like I said, when, you, when you're raising a child, we're supposed to teach them when they're young. So they will grow up and know of these things. But if we teach them bad things when they're young, they're going to grow up as an adult knowing and, 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 and learn bad things. So if we can just come together, wow, you know, but, you know, is that a dream, you know? Fred and Golly, I, I, I appreciate the vulnerability of, of your answer, Devin. You, you've been kind of teeing up questions that drive right to the heart of things. And, um, I, I did, I did see uh, that there's. I think I want to ask the question because I know I think somebody has an, an answer which, or they'd like to give. Is is how did how did the the George Floyd murder? How has you you've been talking big picture but how did this this event or how has it struck you changed you motivated you and, and I think it was Paula am I right that I think I wanted to ask you that Paula um well maybe can you hear me okay we can hear you yes okay I'm having some problems with the computer first off I gotta jump in just one thing back up here I know Devin and I got your answer is I'm a thoughtful scholar and athlete and I'm fabulous. So if anybody asks you again, that's what you say. So anyway, but um, I don't know if, if this is where we're going with the question here. Um, I know Walter wanted me to jump in because we would, were talking about this the other day. I asked Walter, well, how do you feel about this? And he said, the whole, um, George Floyd thing has got me, it makes me feel like my ancestors felt when we were like in chain. And to see that police officer with his knee, you know, his knee on that man's neck made me think about that. And I told him, I said, well, I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't have, I don't know what to say to you. I said, and I know that it must be even worse for you because you have children. And then we start to think, what kind of world are we leaving these kids that that kind of stuff can go on? And it's even worse, I would assume. Um, but I do want to just throw in real quick. The one thing I've always taught my daughter is if you see a problem and you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. So you need to say something. And Honestly, it probably has made her into kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. <laughs> and she's gotten into trouble sometimes at school for that. But I Congratulations, think, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that even, I, I, I think that you can do things in your own little circle if you see something. And I think that that maybe it helped. Um, I don't know. Thank you, Paula. What, what do the rest of you think? Well, it, it made me feel vulnerable uh, and lucky to have lived as long as I have and to recognize that at any given point, if I had said the wrong thing or been in the wrong place, uh, then I could have been in the same situation. So it just exposed to me uh, vulnerability and uh, my love of life uh, and just how fortunate I am to have gotten as far as I have as an uh, African-American man. Chad, I think it, for me also kind of the same thing. I felt vulnerable, but I also thought, what if that was my son's or my grandson? And you know, how would I feel? And what am I leaving for them? Can they can they walk around not feeling their target? Or if they don't say the right thing or look the right way, they could be that could possibly happen to them. And like Paula was saying, and when I explained it to her, my feelings, it, it's the things that I felt like because my dad worked in the stockyard about holding down a pig and just slitting its throat, just holding it down. That's the vision I get in my mind. I can't help it, but I have to see that. And it just infuriates me. 
about how someone could be treated that way like an animal. And, and that's how I feel. Yeah, I felt the same way uh, as far as the animal thing. It kind of reminded me of the hunters that we see in Africa where they've gotten a big game and they've got their foot on the neck and, uh, and with hands in his pocket. That, that probably, that inhumanity that he showed at that moment throughout those eight minutes is what got me was that it wasn't human. He did not see uh, that, uh, Floyd as a human person. He was something less than human. And that's what I saw uh, in that video. Thanks, Jess. I just think that this is motivating uh, me and maybe other people to make some changes. There has to be some policy changes because you just can't go on like business as usual. I don't think we're going to be allowed to do this. The whole world is looking at it. And, and, and you're right, it just crushes you. When you think about eight minutes, that's a long time. And with everybody around looking and telling you, trying to get you to let up, give him a breath, and you still don't do it. I just think now we need to push and get some policy changes because Everybody has a boss and everybody has to respond to somebody, has to answer to somebody. And us as a, a group of people, Americans in this country, we can push to make some policy changes because the culture needs to be a change. It needs to be changed. And, and, and we just can't go on business as usual. This requires some kind of change, and it it and I and like I said earlier, I feel the change. It's like they are starting to to make some changes, and we have to push and don't let it, don't let it, don't let it, don't let it. Yeah, um, what I'm seeing and in, in within this change is I'm loving how. You know, just it's not only the black race is coming out marching now, it's, it's every race is coming out with this now and and it's even more powerful. Um, I saw in Louisville, Kentucky, how there was a group of white women had formed a human chain in front of, in between the police and the black protesters protecting the black race from the police coming in at them. And it was just motivating. My daughter up in Plainfield, Illinois, did a video um, of how there was a lot of uh, white uh, young people. And my, my grandson, but he, he got emotional because he's seeing a lot of his classmates, schoolmates, out, out on the curbs protesting you know, about Black Lives Matter. So yes, there's definitely a change. And young people are fired up. You know, they have a, you know, like I said, this culture now, you know, with this computer age, everybody's, you know, on the computer all the time, all, all race, playing games together and just doing things together now. And to see this kind of stuff go on, like I said, a lot of people, a lot of people not even aware, you know, that this kind of stuff go on in the black race, you know, there and, and, and with this coronavirus, you know, is going on now. A lot of people are at home. A lot of people not, at, you know, are not at work. So they're actually being able to see this kind of stuff. They're able to be uh, sitting still and come to realization, wow, that really happened wow, this really happened to people back in the day, you know, and, and to see people come together now, you know, and coming out and marching and protesting, you know, uh, with the, you know, the blacks, the Black Lives Matter, all kind of signs, is a great change that's in the midst. And, and I really, you know, love to see that. But, but, you know, like you said, with this thing that happened, to Floyd, oh my God, it, it, it was just, 
to see that, it just brought tears to my eyes to see, you know, not only a black man, but a human being, being treated, you know, mistreated like that. It just, you know, like, right, it was heartbreaking, you know, it just, to see that, and, and unfortunately, one of the other cops that was on his back, you know, said to the guy that's on his neck, hey, I'm not feeling no pulse. Do we just turn him on the side? So he had some type of compassion, you know, to, to know that something, was, something wrong was going on, but the man on the neck said no. He didn't even like that, you know. So so he, the other cop got caught up with what was going on you know, with the man that was on his neck. So it, 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 it was just terrible. It was, it was, it was, it was inhumane and it was, it was just terrible. It, it was just, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. It's hard to explain. I have a question if I have that question. If that, and it might not be an easy question. It might not be an easy question to create space. So I've been told, so I'm gonna so go ahead. I've been told, so I'm gonna go. So how can I, so how can I, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. Okay. Um, uh, some of you on here know um, my brother. Um, that he has attended Cop Prairie for a while and he is a law enforcement officer. And um, my question is, how can I fully um, support Black Lives Matter, which I do 100% wholeheartedly, um, while at the same time also supporting my brother and um, some of the really fine men and women that I know he works with, um, because I feel like there's such a divisive rhetoric going on right now in our country that um, you support one or the other, where I feel like I... 100% support Black Lives Matter and it's a movement and it needs to happen and just like Mary was saying there needs to be changes and uh, changes and uh, fully but I'm also praying for my brother just like I I'm praying for everybody in the Black Lives Matter movement so uh, that's my, maybe my challenging question um, how can I communicate that in an effective way that Megan, I'd like to answer. Megan, I'd like to answer, at least from my aspect. And one thing I, I would would ask you to do is share what you learned tonight to with your brother, and at the same time, do something uncomfortable with what you know and what you've learned. I mean, it just makes a difference. And you know, I think Mary talked about people doing the comfortable thing and asking the question what to do. It's the things that don't make you, it doesn't make you feel comfortable, but it's something that's going to make a difference. And I think starting to talk to your brother about this conversation you had tonight is a good start. Maybe talk to the rest of them and, and have a conversation because you understand your brother could have, maybe next time he'll be on the call, who knows. But they can get a better understanding and they might come up with some ideas to, to help people be able to adjust, but also be able to see, because I think their jobs are already already because they have to make a judgment and sometimes make quick judgment calls. And it, it's it's scary because you, you really got to work on getting good at that and be able to still have compassion, but also know where you're in control and where you need to step back. And like I said before, counting to five and not just overreacting too quickly, but saying, where am I at now? What do I need to do? And let me just count and take a breath. Because they do get caught up in things too, but it goes kind of fast and then they, they make decisions without taking a, a second to thought. You hold the guy down, just take a second to think. Let me take a breath and think. And I think that's some of the things I would suggest. You might have something for it. And, and I would say, and uh, with the Black Lives Matter, it, think about it this way. Yes, all lives matter, but right now, black lives or the ones that are up front that are that are having uh, the oppression put on them. For example, just to give you an, an analogy, if you go into a neighborhood and one house is on fire, but that's the only house that's on fire. So the firemen aren't gonna to go to the house that's not on fire, they're gonna go on to the house that's on fire. So Black Lives Matter, 
right now, our house is on fire and we need that to be addressed. And it's not that you're, you're not, you're saying all lives don't matter because people say that to me all the time. But right now, we're talking about our, our lives right now. And, and they, we, want, we want people to realize our lives matter too. It's not just uh, anybody else, because right now, sometimes, and it's not right now, it's been that way a while too, you get the feeling that our lives don't matter. So Black Lives Matter is a movement to say, yes, don't forget, our lives matter too. Uh, I want to piggyback on that. I want to. I, I think the big thing, and hopefully there's not an echo going. Uh, the I think the big thing with, especially with law enforcement officers. So my my both of my sisters worked in the criminal justice system in the state of California for 20 plus years, and one of the comments they always made to me growing up was, "You never need to be in here because you you should have your wits about you to make good decisions," and one of the big things that I think for police officers is having that conversation with people in the community, knowing their community. And I mean, talking to their fellow officers about some of these things, um, the guy, I'll bring up my cop buddy. So, and this, all of these things are happening right now because obviously as was happening, but his police chief approached him um, or, or, or higher up in, in the like the police department and asked him a question kind of similar to that. You know, how, how do we as a department kind of, talk about the bias and talk about racism and those types of things. And the one thing he pointed out was having the conversation and being, being open to the interpretation of others. And I even think, and I, I truly have seen it with, with a lot of the marches, you know, just the love that some of the protesters are showing the police officers who are, you know, are humble enough to take a knee or humble enough to have a conversation or the police chief uh, in Houston. I mean, there, there, are, there are tons of examples out there that th it's not a divisiveness of, you know, which this has happened in the past, you know, blue versus black. I think it's more of having that conversation. And, and if you do have a bias or if you do have, you know, some type of, you know, stigmatism, having that conversation, because the problem with society is if I have that stigmatism or that reaction and I get put in a situation where, you know, it's do or die for me. I'm not going to take that second. I'm not going to double think it, you know, because it's, it's preservation. And I think that's human nature. But I think when you've had that conversation and, and you've talked about your biases and maybe there has been training about it or, you know, obviously policy change would be a, a big addition to that. I mean, that that can create an environment for your brother that, he, I mean, he doesn't have to make a choice that's based off of right he's making a true choice based off of you know this is the consequence for me not doing that and i think right now what's happening is it's not a choice based off of that it's it's a black suspect i mean that and that that for me is super scary <clears throat> just in general because i'm a black male and you know growing up as a black male those are always things that you know my parents have instilled in me that you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to know what you're saying. You need to know how you're saying it. You know how you're presenting yourself. And a lot of young men don't do that. And then situations like this happen. And and obviously, I'm not saying that's what happened with, with Floyd, but I mean, it's just, that is the, the stereotype, you know, that, you know, this black kid is going to try to break my hold and run away. or And it's just, we have to get away from those natural reactions by having conversations. I mean, talking is, is the biggest, you know, indicator. And, and I go back to even 9-11. I mean, you know, people of, of Middle Eastern descent, you know, they were the targets then. And what you saw was you didn't see a lot of African Americans being picked on. Right now, in the last 10 years since that, or nine years since that, I mean, that, that has been the target you know, Hispanics and Blacks. And until that changes, until we start having conversations that are honest and open and asking those types of questions, I mean, that's where you're going to start to see change. Yeah, uh, one thing that I'd like uh, you guys to focus on is common ground. Uh, what is it that Black Lives Matter and the uh, 
police department where they where they start out together instead of starting out where they're separated what is it that you both can agree on and that is saving lives and, and improving community and start maybe that side of it as opposed to the opposite sides and by understanding what we have together maybe you can work backwards and understand each other better going in that direction Yeah. And I'll say to her to support your brother, support your brother, as long as he's doing what he's supposed to do, that's right. It's not part of being with the wrong, you know, and don't, you know, don't settle to peer pressure from his peers on the force to make him commit and do wrong things that he knows that's not of his character. I say to support your brother as well. Support your brother, support everybody, you know, that's trying to do the right thing. You know, you know, like I said, the people that's not doing right, you know, we pray for them. And if it's possible to talk to them, you know, it, sometimes you have to, you know, got to be careful with that. But even with this coronavirus thing, people are killing people because they're not wearing a mask and said something to them about it. So you have to be careful how you approach people. But I say to you, um, support your brother as long as he's doing right. And like they said about um, if you see wrong and you don't say anything about it, you're part of the problem. So if, like, you know, and that's with all of us, that's with everybody. If we see things that's going wrong and we don't say anything about it, we're part of the problem. So we need to speak up, you know, when we see things that, that, that are not right. So support him as well as supporting everybody else. You know, in, in uh, relation you know, to that, in, uh, uh, Fred, uh, so I know Megan's brother, obviously he's a, uh, he and his family are part of our, our church. And one of, the, one of the difficulties for me to get into the, to, to follow what's happening is with one very distant exception, no, not a part of our church, every police officer that I know is of exceedingly high caliber. And, you know, obviously there's people can surprise you, but these are not those guys and women. Right. And so I, I it's, it's hard for, it's hard for, white people of privilege like me to even imagine that, that there could be the kind of brutality and cavalierness that we saw from uh, the officer on, on Mr. Floyd. And so I, I just, I want to say as we're, as we're winding down, at least as we're coming to the end of the, <laughs> the outer end of what our theology on tap usual time is, um, what a, what a privilege it's been for, for me, as a as, as a white guy with with a couple African American friends, um, to hear from to hear from many of you whom I didn't know or I don't know as well, and just to hear what how your eyes and how your heart are are perceiving all this. One of the questions that uh, Walter and I had been talking about is: this obviously isn't a focus group to write new policies or procedures. This isn't a this isn't the United Nations committee or something. This is just a group of people. I think most of us are Christ followers. Uh, we want to make the world a better place and we want to lift up. We, we want to run to the burning house and, and we love all the houses, but this house is on fire and we want to be part of putting it, putting out the fire. It, would there be any interest in, in having this type of, of, gathering again uh, with a, with a structure and maybe a set of questions that that you can think about ahead of time maybe that's got a little bit more back and forth in it i i just wanted to throw that out because that's something that walter and i had talked about um it needn't necessarily be an answer that you you can only answer now or never um but if there were anybody that wanted to speak to that i think we probably need to start winding down especially for those of you on the east coast because you probably have a bedtime you can pick the little button that says yes or no. Oh, you are such a Zoom master. <laughs> um, I would, I would agree to that. 
Well, Fred, I'd make time to see you again, pal. So yeah, <laughs> I'm in. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you what. Um, so my, my address, I'll just give you mine because it's the only one that I can think of right away, is pastordan at cawprairie.org. If you, if you um, send me an email, then I will make sure that you get invited. Um, is that how I do it, Chris? You know things better than I do. It, it, yes, although I'm slightly hurt, you can't remember my email. It's fine though. Um, <laughs> get it. Um, uh, yeah, and there's a bunch of people that have already posted in the chat. Yes, Dan. So um, okay, it seems like there's definitely interest for this. Well, and I want to say there's a number of you that we didn't hear from. I um, you, I, you hear from me a lot because I guess I was the host and I'm, I'm like Walter, a talker. <laughs> um, but I, I want to say thank you to those of you who, who listened and probably have um, some deep stuff to share too. We just didn't get time to, to hear from you. Um, I, I want to ask uh, before we go, if uh, Walter, my brother, would, uh, would you be willing to close us in a, in a prayer for the evening? And then we can send out some. Uh, we can send. We can send out some details um, in the morning light. How about? Sure, definitely. Father God, I lift up everyone on this call, and, and with your grace, and the, the the longing for learning, the longing for the passion and the things that are going on in our lives, but also, you bring us all together to learn in your word. You bring us together to, to share our experiences and learn from each other. And we, we're we so thankful of you, Lord, that you bring us in it and give us the ability to be able to do that. Uh, like I said, these, these relationships that we build, they're a lifetime, they're not for a season. And I thank you, Lord, that you'd be able to do that. And I've been able to have the experience, and I'm sure everyone else, is to meet great people that have you in their heart and you in their minds and always want to improve their love of their life and love of everyone else's life, and they care. I pray, God, that we all step forward and take what we've learned, think about it, and bring back even more energy and time and experiences that we can share to, to make a difference one at a time if it takes each and every one of us and show that we can love and support each other, but also be humble, and be uh, in a trusted environment, like I said, that you bring this trust to us that we're all your, your children and your flock, and we can be in love. And God, I thank you that you're bringing me here to do that and share and Dan to be able to host such a, an event, that it's the start, it's not the end. And we're here to do your bidding and what you would like us to do further. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Uh, us, us Lutherans have an old saying that says, go in peace and serve the Lord. And then you all say, thanks be to God. Um, so whether you say it back or not, just go in peace. <laughs> thanks be to God. And serve God. the Lord. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.